Gold Coasts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now here's WPTV's First Alert Meteorologist. Mostly sunny this afternoon, a beautiful Wednesday, but very warm temperatures once again in the low to mid 80s, especially as we head towards the end of the week tomorrow and Friday. Uh, temperatures will get closer to those mid 80s. So near record highs expected as we close off the week and later on Friday, showers will return into the forecast. On WPTV, First Alert Meteorologist Jennifer Correa on WPTV. STU AM 1450 Martin County's Heritage Station. You are listening to WSTU, Stewart, Jensen Beach, Hope Sound, Martin County's Heritage Station. It's time now for the Casey Ingram Show on WSTU. The opinions expressed are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WSTU. WSTU does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WSTU. It's time to call in with your questions and comments at 220-9788, 220-WSTU. And now, here's Casey Ingram. Well, good morning and welcome back. I have a wonderful show on tap. I always enjoy having Mike Circus here in the studio with me. And, you know, Mike, um, you are, have really been following a lot of different issues that are going on, not only right here in Martin County, but also you've been following some bills that are being introduced up in Tallahassee. So I'm yes, anxious to get into this hour and, and hear what you've been uh, following. Plenty but, uh, of material for the day. <laughs> this is, yeah, we can, <laughs> can always talk more than an hour for sure. Um, but before I do, I want to thank my sponsors. Uh, don't forget about that best kept secret in Martin County. You can come by boat, car, or stroll the boardwalk to explore what the best kept secret has to offer. The boardwalk features local artists, an Airbnb, art gallery, boat charters, marina, and a craft and creamery. It has craft beers, wine, and 24 flavors of ice cream. So literally something for the entire family. And I'll tell you what, as uh, our friends from up north come down to visit us at spring break, uh, what a wonderful place to go and visit. It's down in the pocket in Port Salerno. It's the Fish House Art Center. You can look them up online, thefishhouseartcenter.com. Or give them a call, 772-221-5482. And don't forget, there's a marina there. Uh, commercial Mortgage has been in the industry of small balance corporate finance since 2003. Their focus is on equity, new debt solutions, challenging corporate foreclosures, and debt restructures. Commercial Mortgage never charges a front fee or deposit, and consultation is always FRWE free. Areas of expertise include hotels, marinas, office buildings, restaurants, apartments, multifamily, condos, golf courses, home builders, and land development, including new and repurposed developments. Call Commercial Mortgage at 561-310-5295. That's 310-5295. Or visit them online, commercialmortgagellc.com, helping you with your finances since 2003. Also, we want, want to uh, remind everybody, you can email the KCIngramShow.com. Um, if you go to the KCIngramShow.com, you can sign up for an email blast I put out every week. It just lets you know who's going to be in the studio and the upcoming shows. So make sure you want to <laughs> tune in, and uh, you're always welcome to comment through Facebook or call in at 220-WSTU-220-9788 if you have something to add and uh, have a question or comment for the show. And finally, let's not forget about Indian Town Marina. It is one of South Florida's best mm -hmm. boat storage faci uh, facilities. Located inland on the ok Okeechobee Waterway, they're very, very well protected, Hurricane Hall. But not only that, they're a do-it-yourself and full-service boatyard. And if you own a boat, <laughs> you know you will always need service on that boat. So do-it-yourself, full-service, electrical, mechanical, bottom painting, all that stuff. Uh, you can get that done at Indian Town Marina. Give them a call at 772-631-3272, 772-631-3272. As I mentioned, Mike Circus is here in the studio with me today, and uh, Mike is a near lifelong resident of Martin County, having moved here as a child and leaving only for college and starting his culinary career. Today, Mike works as a carpenter as well as substitute teacher at his children's school. His community experience includes being a leader in the church's youth group, former board member of the Republican Executive Committee, and former board member of the Martin County Farm Bureau. Mike currently volunteers for the Martin County Black History Initiatives, doing historical research and engages in political advocacy at the state and federal levels. In his downtime, Mike enjoys traveling the state, sharing its natural and historic wonders with his new wife and children. I said new wife. It's not exactly new, right? <laughs> that, no, no, we just celebrated our anniversary, so it throws you off a little there bit. There you go. But, uh, 
<laughs> we like to pretend it's still new. It's, so. it's always good to try and keep it new, you know? So oh. how long have you been married now? So we, uh, we've we been married. We just had our 10-year anniversary. Congratulations. Was, uh, a week and a half ago now. Oh. And this November, we'll start 19 years together. Holy so cow. More than half of our lives we've been with each other. Oh, that's wonderful. The fact that she's kept me around that long is a miracle <laughs> in itself. <laughs> Well, she sounds like a wonderful lady. So she, she settled for sure. So, uh, well, I thank God for it daily. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, and happy happy anniversary. And God is one of the things we're going to uh, briefly update folks Excellent. on. Um, and speaking of, uh, you had studied Black history a little bit. Next week, we're going to have Jimmy Smith, and he's president of the NAACP. I think everybody here in Martin County knows Jimmy. Uh, he's going to be man. in here uh, after the 4-Hers. 4-Hers are going to come in at 10 o'clock. We're going to be talking about the Martin County Fair that's coming up. Fantastic! I saw and David will be here with you. Right. Yes. Yep. Dave Hafner. He's uh, taken over the forage program here yep. uh, in Martin County, and I, I know he'll do wonderful things with it. Oh, so. he, he, I can't think of a more perfect position for him or right. a more perfect person for that position, I should say, than David. I mean, he's he's essentially been volunteering in that position for decades. For a long plus. time. So now he, uh, instead of having 15 things he does, I used to call him Mr. Martin County. He did so <laughs> many things in the county. So, uh, oh, that's funny. You know, it's a perfect position for him. He's going to do some really good things. So um, we'll see him next week. Excellent show next week. David Hafner, yes. And I, I always enjoy the Foyagers folks. They work so hard. It's really worth tuning in to hear what these kids do <laughs> to prepare for their big week. It's one week a year and it's coming right up. Um, and then after that, we're going to have, again, Jimmy Smith with the NAACP. I love Jimmy's <laughs> stories. It's, you know, Black history month and uh he he's a martin county resident through and through and grew up here and uh the stories he tells i can listen to over and over again so oh it's we have a we have such a long lineage with with black history here in the county that um kind of gets glazed over unfortunately which is typical across the u.s as a whole but um you know we have some really cool things that have happened here in the county in in african-american history so it's always interesting to see a lot of that come to the forefront especially now with the renewed interest just community-wide, yes. again, here in Martin County, but the state and nationally as a whole. Certainly, certainly, and there's always something there to remind us, and of course, uh, being that's Black History Month, it's a <laughs> wonderful time to just to sit back and reflect on how far we have come, and, and you know, and it, the county really has. And there's oh. still many things we have to improve and do, but yeah. as a whole, we're a wonderful place come to up. be. Here we are in, uh, was it 2023 now, and uh, a lot of people would... I'll be the first one to, uh, to tell you, Spectrum Academy, when I was in high school, I had a very ignorant view of the school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we there are certain things said about it, but I look at Spectrum and, and what it is today is just offering a second chance opportunity for students that honestly probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to finish their education otherwise. What's really interesting is that Spectrum was uh, initially developed as a partnership with Tuskegee, with, well, was born at Tuskegee, a program called the Rosenwald School Fund, which was uh, Booker T. Washington and Julius Roosevelt wow. out of Tuskegee uh, Institute. Hmm. But um, that's where the funding came to develop the school, and it was the only high school for African-American students when it opened in 1925 here in Martin County. And what's really cool about that is by the time that uh, desegregation started to take place and um, in Martin County, the, the Spectrum Academy, or Stewart Training School, as it's called, its population of students absolutely overshadowed all other uh, colored schools in Martin County. Wow. To the point where um, the school board's biggest issue with colored education at the time was trying to get parents to settle down because there was infighting within the African American community to try to get their students who were otherwise district to go to different colored schools, trying to get them into wow. the Stewart Training School under, uh, who was it? Um, Charles Murray at the time was a principal. Uh, oh, wonderful. So Murray Middle School named after uh, Charles and his brother Robert, who were both forerunners of African-American education here in the county. But yeah, it's so interesting to see. I mean, they were fighting over trying to send their kids to this school because of how, how high qualified the school was compared to some others in the county. And it's funny to see we still have some of those things today where, where parents are trying to get their kids out of one school and into the other. Absolutely. So, that is still happening. And the yeah. Spectrum School today has got historical significance just for the reasons that they, you said. So They'll be, what's it, they got 100-year anniversary. 100 2025 years. will be their 100-year anniversary opening up. Obviously, the building itself is completely redeveloped time and time again. Right. But uh, it's the same lot of land that was actually bu- uh, bought in 1919 when we were still part of Palm Beach County before Martin County exists. So. All right, folks. Now you know why I have Mike Circus on. <laughs> and we're off 
topic, is, just like that. I was going to say, I know. This was not even going to be talked about, but look at the information this man has and has stored in his head, and it's just through all your research and your involvement That's through the community. Um, let's talk a little bit here of some updates in Martin County, and then I want to hear sure. about your legislative updates. But um, the first one was, uh, it's back in December now, but the uh, Rural Lifestyle Amendment, we talked mm -hmm. about that. It was passed through the county commission. It was uh, a bit of a contentious and, and well-thought-out vote, but it ended up passing three to two. And then, um, <laughs> and then it had a uh, um, uh, Donna Melzer filed a. Uh, I want to say it just. She wanted an administrative law judge to look at to to see if it comply uh, was in compliance with their comprehensive plan. Uh, she felt that it was ambiguous and not meaningful. So she did. Um, file i'm trying to think it's not really a, a court case but it goes to an administrative law judge uh, a hearing I, i'm curious to see how this one really transpires because a lot of it took the lead off of what was going on in the city of stewart with the costco uh challenge that's right which again went through an administrative challenge and just recently same I, judge by the way it's same judge that makes Folks. sense it is reasonable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't, what, two weeks ago, I think Costco's, uh, the final determination came through with the Florida cabinet to allow it to go forward and, and press on as the as the city had passed it. So it's interesting, or I'd be interested to see how this turns out with the, the rural amendment, the rural lifestyle amendment change, because it kind of follows the same pattern. I mean, it's, we're talking about two different jurisdictions, but it's the same pattern as far as changing your comprehensive plan. It's the same challenge, basically. Exactly. They're talking about land use and the comprehensive plan. And the Florida cabinet is Governor DeSantis, the CFO, Jimmy Patronis, Wilt Simpson, the Ag Commissioner, and Ashley Moody, our Attorney General. Um, it will be super interesting because judge folks found in favor of the challenge, but there was questions about what she used to come up with her uh, ruling. And in that, it was some information that shouldn't have been introduced but was. Mm -hmm. So um, they – brought that up to uh, the the um, the panel, and they did overturn it. So yeah. um, Costco's moving forward, folks. Everybody, I know, it's just that's another contentious issue. There's people that love it, and there's people that said, no, it needed yeah, to be somewhere else. Talk so. about a black and white issue. You're either in love with it or you hate every bit of it. That is um, right. It's, there when, is no middle ground on that particular when topic. When it, it comes seems. to Costco, for sure, there is. So <laughs> Same thing with the rural lifestyle. The rural mm -hmm. lifestyle. So now we're going to see how that plays out, and really we yeah. could be hearing from Judge folks at uh, any time. So... Um, It'll, well, be, it'll be interesting. It'll even be interesting we'll see. to see how the overturn might even affect that particular opinion. Because so much judicial stuff is, is looked at retrospectively, you know, what was in place right. at the time. Um, and then we look at some of the, the decisions that are going forward. Every legislative session has, has this input into comprehensive plans, this input into where the authority is in the local level versus state level on development, especially right now when development is just so on fire. So it would be curious to see if there's any relevance between the two and whether it actually changes her opinion on the matter as well. It truly will be, and that's something that I think every legislative session that gets talked about and argued is home rule. Yes. Um, just all kinds of legislation. And, you know, with that, I've, I'm always a big proponent of home, room, home rule, to be honest with you, Mike. And... Um, but I've seen some yeah. things that really I've said, you know, there are, there are times when home rule, it, it might be better for the state to legislate on that. So it's, it's such a difficult balance to be able to manage both sides of that scale because, you know, on the face, I, I don't think I know anybody that is opposed to home rule. I mean, it just makes sense that local community can best, uh, best take a look at what challenges they're facing and best make rules to face those particular challenges. But having said that, with home rule, the closer you are to your constituency, the more you can kind of have a little bit of a mob rule effect take place. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, I, Toby Overdorf, great man. He and I have had a great relationship in the past working with each other. But I'm not going to run into him at Publix as frequently as I'm going to run into, say, Ed Campy or, you know, somebody else in right. the county commission. So you usually have a much louder voice at your local level than you do at the state or federal level, which is great in a lot of ways. But it also means you can have a heavier push on that, again, that mob mentality. You can get a very loud group of people, small group, but a loud group of people that can that can push forward some ideas that may step on your right as an individual somebody well, that, else's right as an individual that actually happened and i wanted to cover that as well and uh go over the the pet ban the pet, mm -hmm. retail pet store perfect ordinance example. this is an absolute perfect example where you know i was all for home rule and now i'm thinking you know maybe the state needs to look at this because this was something that um in my opinion and i th in your opinion yep. 
you know, it, it violated the Constitution, not only the United States, but the Constitution of Florida. These folks uh, yes, started their business up. It was legal. And then the county turned around for no good reason <laughs> um, and made them illegal. That's it. You know, a very vocal minority um, brought up, and by all means, pet mills are an issue in our country. I'm not going to say that they're not. That's there's, right. There's no doubt about it. Nevertheless, a vocal minority brought forward what they consider to be a solution, but that solution meant putting people out of business who otherwise had every legal opportunity, legal right to do so. And again, not in a proactive manner, but a retroactive manner, right. which really crosses a line as to where the rights of the individual or the rights of the businesses might, might lay. And I mean, I, I'm not going to say the thing, but something, something is paved with good intentions. So Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it is. There was good intentions. And I looked at this, and it's the Humane Society, the National Humane Society, started this initiative 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And at the time, there was, you know, they claimed there was 10,000 puppy mills statewide. So now they've got sure. six different states with statewide bans. They have uh, almost 500 municipalities, counties across the nation that have instituted these bans. And lo and behold, they're saying now there's over 10,000 puppy mills. So it's like clearly, it's well, not effective. You need to go exactly. after the actual and we, problem. And we talk about that vocal minority. They they push that number very heavy, 500 municipalities. Right. There's over 90,000 governing bodies in the United States Right, of so it's a very small The vast amount. majority of them are actually under 20 employees, like special districts that we talk about, water districts, stuff like that. But uh, throughout the entire United States, there's over 90,000 individual governing bodies, about half of which are school districts. So I'm glad you said that. 500 governing bodies yes. is not really a big number when you think about it. And they said something in Florida was like 40 or 60, I don't remember what the number was, municipalities. And this didn't mean counties. It meant it could have been a, a village or Cities, township. Village, That's the, right. the water district of East Hernando County, so, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like maybe, maybe I think it was like 16% of Florida municipalities yeah. had passed this. And remember it was the, one of the biggest Martin things County we got followed. going on right now at the, the uh, state levels, the Reedy Creek Imp- Improvement District, Disney's own little community. Yes, that is a legal municipality. That's right. That is that's, one of. That's that right. That's one, one of our our many. Of, I think we nearly eighteen hundred in the state of Florida alone. So, so it, it just goes to a, show. We had seven of them that were uh, that lost their their district status. That currently have to either reapply to have new district status under the the sixty eight Constitution for the state of Florida. That's one of their deadlines to do that. This legislative district, the majority of which were dissolved because, frankly, they weren't used anyway. But it wasn't just Disney that lost their district status. It was six others, including Disney. Wow. So we have a lot more municipalities than we give credit to. That's right. To. you got to look at the numbers, you know, the details and the numbers. Yes. So um, sometimes it sounds impressive when you say you have 15 mm-hmm. municipalities. But if there's 1,800 total, it really is quite the minority. And I, I'll get off this in one second, but I did want to update folks on this ordinance because in December, right before Christmas, when I was off the air, uh, it did go back to the Board of County Commissioners, and they um, they elected to keep the ban, but to give the pet store six more months before they would need to go out of business. And um, again, that it's a really unfortunate thing. The pet stores did everything that they could uh, to try and, and prove that they are, are good actors, and that's all they wanted was a chance. And I just wanted to share a letter one of the owners had written the county commission, um, and it's, it's a little lengthy, but I took some excerpts from it. Um, it. You know, it's been six months since we learned of the surprise hearing on June 6, where Martin County BOCC publicly informed the community that the BOCC had worked since just following the opening of our business and making a huge investment here in Martin County to draft a pet store ordinance that would order us to close our new business without having met us, without our store ever being inspected, and having afforded us no due process. Throughout this time, nothing has changed since the initial way this process was conducted. There's been no due process, no truthful investigation, process and we have continued to be blindsided by untrue allegations, innuendo, and contrived documentation without ever really having the opportunity to spell those truths. These pet store owners were so frustrated because they wanted, at one point during one of the meetings, one of them said, what are you talking about when they were saying they're buying from puppy mills and they're bad people, they're doing this and that. And they were told to be quiet that public comment was over. (laughs) And so they never got a chance. That's why I'm reading this today. I want to at least give a little you know, fair shake to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, full explanation in response to the allegation that the animal hospital in West Palm Beach had been issued citations in the past. It's true, but the citations were given improperly. Hospitals are not governed by animal care and control or county ordinances. Per the DBPR and the Board of Veterinary Medicine, the hospital does not now, nor has it ever, sold live animals. Um, they said one of the animals there didn't have water. That animal was on an IV fluid. It was under vet care and couldn't drink water. So, you know, it's one of these things you go into these citations and um, 
you know, she really went on in response to the allegation that we purchase puppies from known puppy mills. They do not purchase from puppy mills. And one of her breeders was called a puppy mill by the National Humane Society. And she said it was because <laughs> this person had sold to a pet store that had sold to Petland. Okay. And there are bad actors out there. Mm-hmm. And apparently they didn't want to sell, this puppy breeder didn't want to sell to Petland. But when the Humane Society found out they were selling to Petland, they didn't even realize the pet store had changed ownership to Petland. Okay. They put them on the 100 horrible list. Nice. And so now they're called a puppy mill, and that's one of her breeders. And when that person found out it was Petland, they stopped selling puppy mills. But there you go. Mm-hmm. So there's so many explanations. And I just kind of uh, wanted to share a little bit more. It's a very long letter. I probably take me the rest of half well, hour. I was going to read it all, but honestly, I think you get the point. Well, not to mention, nobody's perfect in life, let's be honest. Right. I mean, there's only right. one perfect being, and I'll tell you right now that I'm not it. I'm not <laughs> so, either. I'm not either, and everybody... So to hold that over somebody's head, yes. it's like, okay, when you found an issue, you rectify it, so you're going to continue to punish somebody right. over a previous issue. I right. mean, I, I think if we were to apply that, that to already took the, responsibility for that issue. And if we were to apply that to the people that made this decision, I don't think it'd work out too well in their favor either. Right. So. <laughs> that's exactly right. So that's that's where it stands with the puppy stores today, and we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, legally, I you know I, I know that they're trying to assess their situation, but it's been disheartening. Sixteen employees they employ here in the county, and yeah. um, it's a safe place to go purchase puppies, and and now that's gone. So it's a dangerous uh, it's a dangerous uh, precedent to set, to say the least. That we would we'd go forward an ordinance on something that retroactively went after people already existing in the county because even for those that are just adamant they don't want to listen to anything they're adamant they're against these pet shops and they want them gone period and that's it ipso facto done you know to set this precedent that we're going to allow ordinances to be crafted at the local level that are retroactive to people existing because somebody comes out and says hey we don't like it that's extremely dangerous. I mean, that could be applied to, I mean, you said it how many times, this is a small business issue. This can be applied to any other business out there. It can and be applied anywhere. Any small business owner should be concerned. I mean, again, this is a violation of the Constitution, ex post facto yes. laws. They were completely legal, and the, the county commission mm-hmm. turned around and made them illegal. For no, you know. Like Stacy brought up, this is the exact thing that fuels the flames of the fight between home rule That's and right. state preemption. You know, the state has a responsibility to ensure the legal uh, the legal rights that are endowed to us as citizens. So when you have something that happens at a local level that counteracts that, the state is the one that is in the position to to come in and say, "Hey, we're going to stop it." And uh, that's that's a hard that's a hard one to to do it for is. the state to give the power back to the counties. It's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, I mean, for years I've looked at home rule issues, particularly in tobacco, but just right. in general, firearms as well. That's one that takes a long time to turn the train back around on, and almost never does the state take a preemption in a case where the counties were not being charged by their citizens for for some right. type of transgression to be overstepping with. them. So it's the always rounds. a fight between the citizens and the county, and the state steps in and takes the toy away from both kids and says, "Guess what? It's mommy and daddy's toy now." That's right. <laughs> so, That's kind of what's, what's happening. You yeah. know, it's like it's hard to get your he- Xbox back when you and your brother <laughs> keep fighting. That's so. right. That's right. So we're just gonna take it away. That's it. You know, and, and unfortunately, I think you know this was one of those cases where I'm like, ah, I can understand why sometimes yeah. the state does overstep home rule because yep. this isn't right to these legal businesses. But um, you know, a small group came in and convinced our commission that they. I, I understand they were Delicate. trying to do a thing. Everybody wants to save abandoned course, and abused. Of course dogs that's that's not the argument that Mm -hmm. happened here though unfortunately so um geez and eric miller uh (laughs) eric miller i'm glad you chimed in he said we need to work close to home and to bring back freedom eric you're going to be uh on the show uh we're looking at hosting a show march 1st um because there's a lot of things that are happening in indian town and scott watson filed a election complaint with the florida election commission and uh lo and behold they are charging robert burns who got really in infiltrated Indian town politics who's up in yes. Brevard County and uh, you know Eric's looking into some information up in Brevard County about this and uh, I know Scott Watson is very excited there's 42 counts of elect- election fraud being charged against uh, Robert Burns it's just unbelievable story what's happening out there oh. Indian Indian Town's uh, potential has been there just forever in a day. Indian Town's had the potential for for great expansion, great growth. Um, And they were really hamstringed by the county for a long time before they they had their incorporation as a village. So I can fully understand a lot of the, the reasons why people wanted to incorporate. Having said that, a lot of people recognize that incorporation is now an extra level of government 
I don't want to say interference, but government to work with or to work against you, either right. or, right. depending on how well you get organized, especially from the get-go, which really was the struggle for Indian Town. I mean, they had a hard time getting their legs under them in an organized fashion, and unfortunately, they're kind of getting to that time to pay the piper. Truly. Really- um, you know, I, it's it's exciting to see Taryn now in a, I guess, an interim position yes. is what they have her with for the uh, the village of Indian Town. I mean, she's got yes, a Commissioner Harold Jenkins says, I want her back because she, <laughs> she works for him with his landscaping company. So it's supposed to be interim. We'll see how it all plays out. We'll see how it plays <laughs> out. But now they have somebody that has a, from an administrative standpoint, not an elected position, but an administrative standpoint, they have somebody that has right. just a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I mean, I know a lot of people that uh, ideologically do not like uh, Taryn Krista. And that's all right. We all have ideological differences, but that's where the importance is from an administrative standpoint. She has an experience to know how to dot her I's and cross her T's, right? which is something that the village just desperately needs at this state. It so. really needed a true leader. And I think that they showed that, you know, you got to watch who's infiltrating the politics. It's going to be mm-hmm. really interesting. Something else, Eric said he heard his name in the audio draft. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't push the red button, Eric. Um, <laughs> we did that on purpose, yeah. Eric. <laughs> uh, but he's going to talk a little bit about the Brevard REC. I mean, they uh, they have where they feel like they've been infiltrated mm-hmm. um, from the Democratic Party. So, And then they use this, this Robert Burns to attack fellow Republicans. And Randy hmm. Fine is part of the person that okay. had, yep. uh, you know, filed these election yep. um, contention he's, complaints. He's a great stalwart oh. of the state. He's, yes, uh, he is. Randy bigger, Fine really is. Uh, he, he may be our next governor. Who knows? Um, you never know. I'll tell you what. You know, I never really thought about that, but I can see where... Or he might he head might. in that direction. I can see the potential in that. He might. So. We'll see after we get after get our great Governor DeSantis elected president. <laughs> no, he hasn't filed yet. But we all, you know, we all Worst realize he's going secret. that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Worst kept secret ever. So, <laughs> but uh, but really exciting times that are going on and all these things, folks. I think it just tells oh. you that we really have to be involved locally and mm-hmm. really know what's going on. And you just can't. I think one thing that happens that's sad for me is unless it's in your backyard unless it affects you personally people just don't seem to get involved and really pay attention and then all of a sudden it happens to you and you don't have the support you need from others and i'll tell you i mean i great wife two fantastic kids i gotta work to keep food in my belly just like absolutely everybody else i fully understand it takes a lot of time just to stay alive these days let alone getting into something like politics where there's a legitimate feeling that that people are just spinning their wheels. I mean, there's a lot of people. Oh, you feel like many it's times you're not time. heard. You know, a lot of people feel that way, and I'm not going to tell you that every time you put forward your effort, it's going to pay off. Because realistically, it's it's an uphill battle every step of the way. Nevertheless, if you throw in the towel now, it's never going to change. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, your only hope is to get your voice out there, That's try it. to reach out. Um, you may not get a response, but hopefully, when there's enough people, yep. you you will get a response. I can tell you that. If you rally enough support, worst you case will get a scenario, you're going to sleep easy at night knowing you did your part. Yes. yes. Worst case scenario. <laughs> And we always say, if you don't vote, don't complain. Get that's out there it. and vote. That's, exactly. where it, that's where it starts. If you're going to do something, at least vote, right? That's right. That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> so, all right, Mike. So tell us what's going on here. We'll start with the county, and then we'll kind of move up to what's happening in Tallahassee. Sure, sure. So I guess it was the last meeting, the 24th, the county had their legislative priorities, what they're looking to, to achieve going throughout this year. And a lot of it's the same that we've had for several years now. We're looking at, obviously, water quality issues are a big thing, yes. big concern. Uh, Sarah Hurd had stated that one of her her objectives or I said two objectives she had that she specifically stated one of them was looking at the the releases out of Lake Okeechobee from a mechanical standpoint which I thought to be quite ingenious I mean we know that there's very limited things we can do as a local body when it comes to water discharges out of Lake Okeechobee yes as that's a, a predominantly federal decision as well as some some state in, in uh, involvement but Sarah had a very a very good point the locks or the the water discharge we have now essentially the water rolls under the locks which brings with it sediment which brings with it a lot of uh, not just water but the the actual uh, the nutrients actual dirt and pollutants. nutrient mm-hmm. pollutant itself but there's several other locks where you can lower them top down where water spills over instead of having it flushing out as a fully open gate or well, flushing that's interesting. from the bottom so it's it's a unique way it's a new way to take a look at the problem i mean we've spent decades spinning our wheels trying to say stop the water flow and we've gotten i don't want to say we've gotten to the end of that road we're not throwing the talent on that fight either but looking at it from new and unique perspectives where it's like okay how can we manage if we're going to receive the water how can we get the cleanest water instead of dirt and muck at the same time 
right. So it, it's and this is something that's been done in other in other water release channels around the lake. So it's not like Martin County is reinventing the wheel on that either. So uh, I it really makes sense, my, Mike. It does. It's it's a it makes sense. Not to mention the fact that these are newer systems, which indicate you flip that coin over. If it's a newer system, it indicates the one right. you got's an older system. Right. So these right. things in themselves have a, a shelf life on them where they have to be replaced for safety purposes anyway. So if they're going to repla- be replaced or they're coming up on the end of their usable shelf life, why replace them with a, a system that we know probably isn't the best opportunity? That's if right. You've got to tear it out and redo it anyway. Why don't we do it with an improved system where we're getting the water, but not the muck and the sediment that's, and such like that? That's right. So, I mean, it, something like that. I, I really, like that priority. I think it's a fantastic thing. It's a great priority. And let's be honest, Sarah Heard made it very clear that water is her priority. Natural environment is her priority. But Always to be able to, to look at this and say, okay, here's what we've learned in the past. Here's right. how far we've gotten. Let's look at this from a different angle. Maybe we can be more effective or at least have more options coming in by going this route. So I thought that was fantastic. Uh, fantastic. She brought that up. A very inventive idea that I'd love to see explored both the county I think it's a state. great idea. I think it'd be fantastic. I really do. Uh, another one of hers, I think it's a bit of a long shot and... Um, I love that she brought it up, but trying to get a national park designation for the Indian River Lagoon itself, which I I think she's really shooting for the stars there. Mike, I had the Indian uh, River keep around a week or two ago, Jim Moyer, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what he said his goal is as well, is to try and get this designated as a national park. It would Tough be to do, yes. But. It'd be fantastic. There's only 42 or maybe 50 national parks in the in of course, we got the Everglades, yeah. you know. I mean, the Department of the Interior has about 500 locations over 50 states and six different uh, six different territories that are owned by the United States. There's about 500 locations that the Department of the Interior oversees as you know national park or national park affiliated sites. So the Indian River Lagoon getting that designation is going to be a very very a hard hell battle. Shot. Having said that, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's right. So <laughs> Got to try it. <laughs> why not try? I mean, if it's not going to bankrupt the county, if it's not going to be a huge financial thing, and we're talking about right. time and labor, especially in something like this where it's mostly volunteers putting forward the time and labor to make that happen. That's right. It is. We'll take all the help we can get, especially if it has the opportunity to open up new funds and new financing. Yes. So, yes. And protections. Hopefully that's much, it. Very so. much. Very much. So I, the protections aspect, that brings up a great point, too. I mean, the protection aspects are in areas that are prime for development that realistically are going to be developed over the next 30, 40, 50 right. years. So that's going to be an uphill battle in itself, whereas trying to protect those areas from future development when they are the most reasonably placed areas for future development, that's kind of going to be, that's going to be It'll a hard be a shot battle. across the bow mm-hmm. to, to get going. But, uh, you know, I, I tip my hat for her again. She's looking at new and creative ways instead of trying to do the same thing over and over like we've done the last several decades. Right. So. So kudos to her on that, and I, I wish her the best of luck. So. Absolutely, absolutely. So, some of the other things we had coming on is that, uh, let's see, if, give me a second here. I, I actually got notes this time. Read so your, read your notes, and I'm going to update one while you're Okay, you update around. one. One is the All Aboard Florida Bright Line Bridge here in Stewart. Mm-hmm. It's going to be closed. They're scheduled for three solid weeks, May 1st yes. to the 21st, and then two weeks before that, two weeks after that overnight from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., I believe. So that is going to be absolutely you know devastating. If you're west of the bridge, you're you're not going to be getting yeah. through. Yeah. So, um, you know. What a 100-year-old trellis. Oh, what other gosh. option do you have? They have to, they have to do their upgrades, and yeah. let's, let's just hope the upgrades actually work so that the thing goes up and down and doesn't get stuck in the up or down position so Uh, and maybe it'll be quicker i don't know um i i don't know so but three weeks is a long time intended yeah i know it is process has been (laughs) so it is it is so uh, you know but uh, as i forget the other two that uh legislative priorities one one was brought forward by commissioner affordable housing several commissioners uh, ed campy and miss hetherington as well brought this up you know affordable housing is just perpetual problem across our community everywhere. state the f- everywhere. federal level everywhere and this is something i i'm interested to see what transpires because this is the the main priority that's been voiced at the the florida senate and the florida house so how much action might take place here locally or how much efforts put locally and quite frankly there's only so much you can do locally to affect change Agreed. in this policy matter um i i don't think we're gonna see a whole lot of anything except for discussion for the foreseeable future at the local level and not that the local level can't do anything but it's also practical to make sure we wait until after may when the state is done with theirs so we know what laws the state's going to 
uh, if any changes the state makes coming up in July. Um, you know, wait until yeah. that point. This way, the county can have some direction. Okay, what can we do? What can't we do? You know, what is practical? What is their financing or what state grants might be available or national it's, grants might be available? It's so tough, Mike. Do you know, I just in the newspaper, uh, TC Palm this past weekend, they put out, we had record-breaking numbers of people moving to Florida. We always heard 1,000 a week. I broke down the numbers last year, 1,500 and not a week, 1,598 yeah. people, basically 1,600 people a day are moving to Florida. 1,600 a day. And, you know, everybody talked about in Stewart, oh, we have 3,000 new apartments. That's two days worth of people. Yeah. We have so many people moving here. I mean, to, to attack this affordable housing, there's such a demand. It's tough, tough, I, tough, I'm tough. blessed and fortunate. I have a meeting this afternoon with Toby Overdorf's folks. I've had some great productive conversations with John Snyder's team as well as with Ms. Harrell's team over the last couple of weeks. One policy that I'm looking at uh, working at this particular session is a change to Florida's Homestead Act, uh, particularly our Save Our Homes Act. So in the state of Florida, you can leave your home to your spouse without losing that 3% or CPI cap. Okay. You can also leave it to your minor children without losing that 3% CPI cap. But if I were, let's say I'm 80 years old and I'm ready to leave it to my children at 50 years of age, when I go to leave my home to them, they lose that cap. Yes. So you think about what kind of financial burden that is. I crunched the numbers on my own family home. My, my folks still live in the same house that I grew up in starting from fifth grade on. If they were to leave that to my younger brother to entice him to move back from North Carolina, if they were to leave that home to him, their property tax bill would increase 197%. And you know, it, to me, it's just kind of a jarring thing to think about. Because it's staying How, within the family. Exactly. How are we ever going to offer affordable housing at any level if you can't even leave a house free of charge to your, to your next to kin That's right. without punitively hitting them with such a high tax burden that they can't afford it either? I mean, it's it just I, I agree with you. Be able to do with that. And it, it's really funny because the Save Our Homes Act is part of a homestead law. Homestead laws were intended for that purpose. It wasn't to, to make housing affordable for people, per se, to travel from one house to the next to the next, like portability does right. today. The purpose was you got yourself your 20 acres and you settled that land. That's right. Now you hand it down to your children, your grandchildren, you pass it down the line, which is very counterintuitive to the portability aspect we use today. Not that I'm against portability. I think it's fantastic. But nevertheless, if you can't even hand your house to it's, your kids without yeah. killing them on taxes, it's, how are you going to make anything it's affordable? It's much the same as the inheritance tax, and that really mm -hmm. struck farmers the hardest because uh, mom and dad would die, you'd inherit the farm, oh. and you couldn't afford the taxes that it was exactly. charged for you for the inheritance tax because it was an asset now all that's, of a sudden. That's one of the primary <laughs> examples that we used in this, in this legislative change that we're proposing. When we look at small farms, I mean, small farms are people that are usually borrowing against next year's profits right. to be able to put the seeds in the ground today. So when you have a the patriarch and the matriarch passes on, and they are, you know, God willing, fortunate enough to have a next kin willing to take over the farm, which right. itself is right. a miracle these days. Right. Uh, if they do have that next kin willing to take it over, not only do you have the financial aspects of the business and the taxes on the business, and then you have your your agricultural tax classifications having to go through that process starting from scratch because now you have a name designation change. Then you hit them with a property tax valuation over a large scale size of land, even if it's a small farm of 100 acres. That is a huge property tax bill to swallow, even if it's only that one year in your gap year where you're getting your paperwork right, straight. Right. That gap year, when you're borrowing profits from the next year to put seeds in the ground today, it's just not sustainable. No. And I mean, the, yeah. the number one leader of, of wealth in this nation is familial wealth, passing it down from generation to generation to generation. We talk about this great income disparity between the haves and the have-nots in this country. It's because trying just to live these days and, and trying to have the funds to everybody have their own single little household, yes. it simply isn't a sustainable model. And you know, 206, 207 nations are on this big blue marble that we have. That's we're, right. We're about the only one that doesn't have a, a multi-generational aspect to living. And I'll tell you, some of the greatest years that I've had was living with my father-in-law when my wife and I were first married and our daughters were first born. Uh, you know, not only from the financial aspect that it gave us an opportunity to save up our funds and not, you know, we all split bills, right. but splitting bills is a lot better than everybody having their own household and having those bills to swallow. It gave you the opportunity to get on your feet but and save up a little bit. Save up money. It's a great aspect that, um, you know, you have that expendable income to put back into your community as well. I mean, if I'm not spending all my money on That's electric right. and rent, I can go over to the restaurant across the street and support the income. I can go over to the Elliott Museum or maybe I want to go, you know, if someone's doing this in Orange County or Orange County and they want to come down to the little old Stewart to go fishing, 
eighteen percent bed tax. I mean, if you have a multi generational household in another part of the state, you got money to go on vacation. And there's a lot of financial draw to being able to to kind of put more people in houses. And even the basic idea, if you're putting people into underutilized houses now, grandma has three bed bedrooms in her house. Well, if we're putting more people, the same family into that one house, that's less demand for people to buy up more houses. Right. Less demand on people to get into apartments and rentals. That little demand, that uh, that relief on demand means we have more houses for sale, less building uh, bidding wars to buy houses, so the costs come down. You know, less house demand means less need to build more houses. Supply and on demand, spec. simple mean, economics, right? It's, I guess the best example I can give is no, there's no silver bullet to affordable housing, but our proposal to to encourage multi generational housing is kind of like a shotgun blast. You know, each pebble of, takes away a little piece of. What kind all of feedback these are you getting as you're speaking with our representatives? Yeah, I was very happy. Gail, for example, I was very happy. The four county coalition. She brought this up on her own volition. You know, she said Great. we're looking at this option here on the um, the homestead homestead act. We're looking at this as a save our homes cap. So she brought that up herself, which was extremely encouraging to see. Um, like I said, I'm talking to Toby later on this afternoon. His group, John's people, they were very. Miss Sweeney was extremely uh, uh, happy to hear what we were having. Very encouraged and. Um, which is great. They, it seemed like there's good reception on both ends. Haven't yet seen. Uh, we're, we're trying to do is get this as an amendment onto an already proposed okay. piece of legislation that's already in the uh, the House and the Senate. The okay. House sponsor just came through last week, I guess it was. So we're trying to get this as an amendment, but it, it's looking encouraging so far. But we'll see. I mean, it's, it's exciting. You know, it is. Nothing's over until the fat lady says. No, that isn't. And somebody's got to propose the idea. Challenge it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. So. And like I said, somebody's got to propose the idea. You know, our legislative, they've already had the meeting this year, but every year yes. they'll get together and they, they it's usually out at IRSC. Mm-hmm. And um, it, bring your ideas, bring sample bills, and you exactly. never know which yep. ones might make it to the floor. Yeah, I, I've. I went up a few years ago. There's a House member. We had something that was going on at the federal level, and I had a four-page proposal typed up. It says, here, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to see the House from Florida just put together a non-binding resolution that says, hey, we support this idea. Send it over to the feds and just get your official support behind it. And I'll tell you, this particular House member, he took about 30 seconds to read through it and stuck his head out the door, yelled at his legislative aide, and says, I want this down in drafting. I mean, I kid you not, it wasn't more than a 15-minute process. And... You know, it didn't get too far in the House, but we're, I can go online now to the uh, Library of Congress and I can look up that piece of legislation inside the Federal Registrar because it was officially filed as a support letter. That's awesome. And so, it can always come back. You can always try another year. So. That, that's exactly it. So you never know until you try. You don't. What else is happening up in Tallahassee? I know you've been following a lot uh, of the bills that have been filed. And, you know, I think last year there was over 2,000 bills that, you know, initially get filed. And there was incredible about 3,600 bills. Uh, average 3,500 bills that are averaged over the last five years and now a lot of these are duplicates because you have a senate and a house bill but still i mean 3,600 pieces of legislation to be filed in a session for 60 days yes is a i was lot gonna say it's material. a two-month session it's you great know, it's, i'm curious to see i got a feeling there might be a little bit of rollback i checked this morning it was uh was it 484 as of this morning before i came in today we still have four more weeks of committee before weeks. session starts yep, four more weeks of committee <laughs> weeks before session even starts and you know worst ca- or uh, little secret committee weeks are the way we cheat because you get 60 days of session by law that is it you have right. 60 days to do your work so we have eight committee weeks. So I don't want to say as a cheat. I don't mean it like that. We have eight committee weeks as a way You're to getting more work done, right? Exactly. <laughs> artificially expand because now we can weed through some of the things that, that might not make it to the floor or probably don't deserve Concentrate enough. on those that should. Prioritize. Exactly. Prioritize. Did you see some other bills so, up there that uh, folks might be interested in? I know, you know, like insurance regulation is such a huge we'll see, we're topic. See, I don't think we're, there's not a whole lot for insurance regulation at this stage because we're coming off of the special sessions on insurance you know the big draw this year looks to be um affordable housing okay affordable housing is gonna be a very big one uh senate president just dropped her affordable housing bill last week it was 93 pages which wow. by by state of florida standards is a pretty lengthy bill um this one, I'll be honest, affordable housing is very important to me, but I'm very concerned about it. Uh, when you read through it, it's very heavy-handed in regulation on development, or it seems to be heavy-handed in regulation on development, trying to make sure that we're building houses that fall within a financial criteria that's accessible to people that are, I think, 150, 250 percent of the poverty line. And that's kind of a scary notion to me. You know, yes, we build yes. houses on the perspective of, okay, people that are in poverty-stricken situations can afford them. 
that that's a dangerous precedent to set just because you know that's an ever shifting target you know I, yes when yes. our cpi is seven eight nine percent now three years ago it was one and a half to two percent so cost of living skyrocketed over the last two years meaning that affordability is completely tanked it's highly volatile so if you're going to build houses out especially some like communities that are multi-year plan outs right you have absolutely no idea what's going to be affordable in three years no you I don't mean, Two thousand dollars a month might be unobtainable today. Two thousand dollars a month might be reasonable in three years. It might be absolutely unobtainable in three years, or that might be dirt cheap and everybody's shocked. Oh, I can't believe I can get this for two thousand dollars a month. You know, you just have absolutely no idea with forward planning. So, to me, the going through a process of a mo shooting at a moving target like that, as opposed to looking at how can we make things affordable by just having more money in people's pocket or making things uh, more accessible that are already in place today, stuff that can be started within six months instead of five years. That's that's my general idea how to do things. Not to say that the, the senator's proposal is bad, but um, it's just an ideological it, difference. It's tough for government because they have to be in a position where, you know, they need to help the private sector really, uh, you know, provide things that our society needs, yes. not, not do it, not well, take, take over everything. So, And we all know the unintended consequences oh. always seem to emerge. So if you're going to put this restriction on people saying, hey, we're not going to allow you to build if you don't have X amount of your buildings right. within affordable housing. Okay, so how many people are going to turn around and say, well, we're just not going to build? We're just going to do it. So, okay, we're just... We're not building anymore. Well, now you have a limit on how many structures and how many units are available, which makes the units that are available skyrocket once more. You That's know, absolutely right, because, you know, builders have to depend on the cost of the goods. I mean, they, they have their own numbers that yeah. they have to make as well. So if you, the government yeah. comes in and tells them you have to start renting at $500 a month, they're going to walk yeah. away. Well, in a speculative industry like construction is to begin with, when you're building everything out on spec, you already know that your profits are going to be either great or they're not going to be existent at all. So if you're going to tell somebody you're limiting their profitability before they even put a pen to right. paper to sign a contract that's a huge dissuade it so is it is it, it, we'll it see what is. happens but so, um you know some tough. other things i know the governor i'm sorry yeah real quick here uh, we have a former speaker pro temp uh, marilyn magar she's also the chairwoman of our martin county rac appreciate you tuning in and she wants to know and you can uh, contact her after the show if you could come and present at one of the rac meetings you have some wonderful information here um, that to. i think would be great to to share with everybody so uh, i'll tell you marilyn fantastic one of one of my favorite members Memories, real off topic. One of my favorite memories going up to Tallahassee. Me and actually David, he'll be in office with you next week. Dave uh, Hefner. Dave and I going up there with Farm Bureau. So Mary Lynn used to have hanging on her wall pieces of art from throughout the community, and several of them were 4-H students. And I remember going up here, uh, going up there, Dave and I, we had some fresh from, fresh from Martin County vegetables and eggs we brought up. Yes. And uh, seeing that little piece of, piece of art hanging up on a wall from a local community member is really cool. So it is. It's very, it's very meaningful. I still remember that. So <laughs> I still remember that, Mary Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> we but. miss you, and we hope we get her back in office here in the future. We'll see how that yeah. goes. But, yeah, I think, we'll uh, I think you would be a wonderful speaker for the REC. I'd You've got some to. great information. I'd love to. Uh, some of the other things we got going on at the state level, uh, the Governor DeSantis has put forward what is the number one House bill, HB1, which, quick side note, when you look at a, a bill, the lower the number is, the higher the priority. Okay. So if you see a House Bill 7,812, it's probably <laughs> not high on the All committee right. list. House Bill 1 is going to get some attention. That's okay. just how they unofficially Good structure the stuff. So HB1 is a school choice bill that uh, Florida already has a pretty wide open voucher program for students that are bullied, students who are in families that are below a certain income level, uh, first responders, so police, fire, rescue, stuff like that. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, police, fire, rescue that are active in the state under a state licensure, they, get first, um, they can get choice for voucher to send their kids pretty much anywhere to begin okay. with. Obviously, within reason, the voucher only covers the same financial amount that the state would reimburse to the local school district. So it's not like you get to send your kid to a $60,000 a year right. school for free. Right. You're still going to get that 7000 that would have right. gone to your local school district. And so, uh, But the, it's looking to expand that essentially to everybody, which I think is fantastic. I'm a huge proponent of school choice. Uh, I, I think this... I know there's a lot of people that are kind of counterintuitive to it. They see this as a uh, pulling money away from local school districts. 
I, on the other hand, would suggest like this. School districts are reimbursed for every pupil they bring in. So it's not that the state is punishing them by not giving them money. It's up to the school district to make their district enticing to bring those students in. That's right. So if your district is like Martin County, where we have a highly sought after school district, I mean, we have some pretty good population numbers. You know, there's other districts that are not as fortunate. So allowing parents the opportunity to send their kids to a more appealing school and having the funds to do so, I just think is a no brainer. So that's the theory I, of competition. You you try and improve yourself to get that customer. So exactly, that, that's exactly. what competition's about. If if you're just handed money and you don't have to do anything to improve yourself, there is no incentive to to provide something better. It, exactly. I mean, why are you going to put forth the time and the effort to reinvest into your structure if you feel like you're already going to be stuck there? Right. You made what you're going to made, and that's it. That's it. You might as well just sit back and throw in the towel. So if you have students that are going into private schools in your community and you're running a local school district, then that's a great way to sit back and say okay why are they going to these schools right maybe it's something that the parents are just uh, the parents are just religious for example and they want to send their kids to a religious place you're probably not going to capture them in your local school district and that's perfectly acceptable but maybe your school district's struggling and you have whatever your agenda might be you can recapture those parents by looking at it is it something we can actually change and fix right so right you never know and speaking uh, of education dr anselon is going to be on the show on february 15th and he's going to be talking about the irsc promise program oh what a beautiful program oh my that gosh is two years free for uh students coming yes. out of martin county yes i mean that's it's incredible and I, if i'm not mistaken that's almost all private dollars too that's not public dollars i do at believe all. it is i'll ask so. him but i believe it is i think it was a grant that was given to the school so yep. it's absolutely incredible, so. but that's going to be exciting to hear how that's been rolling out and it's expanding. That's yep. the great part. Yeah, really, the only other one at the state level. Well, there's a there's a whole slew of them, but we always run out of time. Of course, I know. Yep. There's one Evan's right telling now. us four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> there's one right now that that takes a look at how we address recalling constitutional officers and elected officials at the local level, and this is one that I would highly hmm. say that people need to th- think about and reflect on before they go pushing into it. Because right now in the in the state we have two different counties. We have chartered counties and non-chartered counties. With a chartered county, you get a lot more leeway to enact rules and regulations that are beyond that of, of the state. So you kind of get a stronger level of home rule. Having said that, the downside is that you can be recalled from office. So this gives the opportunity for the citizens to turn around and say, we don't like what we're doing, we're pulling you out. Uh, it cannot happen for non-chartered counties. So. Why that? What makes that important is when when you take away that threat of we're going to recall you, if we place that onto non-chartered counties and say, hey, we're going to recall you if we don't like what you're doing, well, now you've taken away any incentive to keep them in line. So right. if you can punish somebody, you're going to threaten to punish them with a recall, then what's to stop them from saying, okay, if I'm going to get punished, well, we're going to go that extra mile now. So you kind of lose that checks and balances system in there. Not to say that it's a bad a bad thing to do, but that is going to require citizens to be significantly more involved preemptively. We cannot keep up this reactionary measure of, oh, this came to play, and now we're going to fight it after it's all said and done. Pet shop ban, for yes. example, perfect yep. example. You can't exactly. fight it retroactively. If you're going to take away the threat for your county officials or take away that protection and threaten them with recall for doing something wrong, you're giving them that extra authority. To, okay, if I'm going to get punished, I'm going for it. So we as a citizen would be more required to go forward and make sure that we're not getting into that pickle to begin with. Because- well, you're talking about unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. Okay, it sounds good. We can we can just recall them and that's it. But there's unintended consequences to that. That's exactly it. So. And, uh, yeah, so you don't know. So that's that's going to be an interesting bill to watch, honestly. That will be an interesting one to see to play out because it's you can't really quantify something like that. You know, Unintended consequences are just that. You cannot predict them until they start to come to play. Right. So that's why you really got to think these ones through look at your wording and see how is this going to work out because there's going to be a curveball in there guaranteed so. there will there will there's always um, something <laughs> and then i get really you know real quick i know we got one minute yeah. left but i want to touch on constitutional carry just popped yesterday yes and the, uh, this will be very interesting to see because the constitutional carry I, I i'm even remiss to call it constitutional carry because realistically there's still a significant amount of regulation that sticks forward in this bill essentially what we're doing is a permitless carry you don't you're not going to be required to have a permit to conceal carry in the state of florida it's still going to be illegal to open carry should you decide to go or should this bill pass. So uh, this is going to be an interesting one to see how it plays out because the open carry aspect is really one of the biggest problems with constitutional carry in the state. People that want to carry a firearm concealed, 
you know, people that are on the up and up and on the good side, they, they suck it up and they pay their $90 and they get their That's permission right. slips. So yeah, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see how this one actually transpires. But uh, I got a feeling that one's going to go through a lot of revision and committee. <laughs> I bet it will. It's certainly going to get a lot of publicity as well. I Most mean, definitely. Just <laughs> across the nation with all the gun laws and gun arguments and, you know, uh, controls that want to be put out there. And, of course, you know, NRA will be, I'm sure, here. And sure. it's we, we have just 30 seconds. Mike Circus, <laughs> appreciate you coming into the studio today. Uh, Mike, you'll definitely be back and uh, continue following up on these bills that you've talked oh, yeah. about. It'd be very interesting to see what happens. <laughs> Session starts March 1st. Uh, I think it's yep, March 7th. March sure. 7th. Yep. So yeah, it's coming so. up next week. I'll see you back here. And we're going to have again Jimmy Smith and uh, 4 years with Dave Hatcher. Four with Dave. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you next Wednesday. Mm-hmm.